So I talked to you about this before, and you've been open about uh, sharing your testimony. We're doing our series, What Does the Bible Say? And today we're going to be addressing abortion and the Christian response. As you know, this is a subject I'm very passionate about, but this is also a subject that you're very passionate about for a very personal reason. Why is that? Well, first, my name is Heather. I'm Jer's wife, if you don't know me. And when I was 19 years old, I, I had made the unfortunate decision to have an abortion. And uh, it's a decision that has, has haunted me ever since. Um, and now I feel I have a, a responsibility to empower women to know that they, they can carry this gift that, of life that God has blessed them with. So what kind of support did you have, or did you just feel as though this were the only option? At that time in my life, um, I had just joined the military. Uh, I was 19 years old, living in Chicago at a training station, and I had just gotten my orders that I was going to move to Annapolis, Maryland, when anybody who has ever loved me was back in Georgia. And this just made me feel so helpless and completely alone. And at that time, I hadn't surrendered my life to Christ yet, so this felt like it was my only option. What many people overlook when it comes to abortion is, is the mother. What did you go through following the abortion? You know, as soon as I left that building, I, I knew I had just made the deepest regret of my entire life. And all I could do was just go back to my dorm and cry myself to sleep. Um, it felt like there was just this dark cloud that had covered me every day, wherever I went. Um, I just, I was depressed, and it took years of daily remembrance that God had forgiven me, and I need to as well, while at the same time, it felt like God was punishing me and withholding motherhood from me because of this costly decision. Um, and while I know that's not true, I stand here today having been fully forgiven and forgiven myself, but you know, it's, it's still in the back of my mind, and I think it's a, something that I'm going to spend the rest of my life healing from that decision. If there was a girl who was pregnant and feeling the same thing you did, or if we put it this way, if you could go back and speak to 19-year-old Heather, what would you say? First things first, I would tell 19-year-old Heather to get better friends, but failing that, I would just plead with her just to breathe. You know, I know that, I know that you're scared, um, but rest fully in the knowledge and knowing that Christ, with Christ, you can do this, um, whether through the route of adoption or welcoming motherhood, that you are not alone, um, and that no matter what the circumstances are, that this child is a gift. And please don't choose abortion just to save yourself from nine months of temporary embarrassment, um, but to come talk to me, because you are stronger than you think. So why were you so willing to share this part of your past to your church family as well as anyone who watches this online? Well, I think it's vitally important that we share each other's testimonies um, and pointing it back to Christ. You know, I am who I am today because of the redemption that Christ has offered on the cross. And I wasn't strong back then, but with Christ, he strengthens me. And I wanted to give somebody a, a name and a face that they could come talk to me if they needed help or support or guidance, especially since I didn't feel like I had any at that time. Well, Heather, I'm very, very proud of you. Thank you so much for being open and vulnerable with us and sharing that part of your life. Um, as she returns to her seat, uh, if you guys could please watch the screen. Right where you are, I just want you to, right there in your seats, just shut your eyes. 
What you're about to hear are the sounds of metal BB striking the side of a tin can. For every BB that strikes, it represents 10,000 lives lost in the wars of America's past. 10,000 lives for every BB. This is the reality of what is occurring in your country. The American Revolution. The Civil War. World War One. World War Two. The Korean Conflict. The Conflict in Vietnam. September 11th and the War on Terror. Since 1973, the War on the Unborn Child. Well, that puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Now, today I'm not going to stand up here and faint neutrality. I'm not neutral on this issue, and no Christian should be. And I'll say it outright no Bible believing Christian should be pro choice. The Word of God does not give us this justification for that stance. Now, I do hope to show you today through the Word of God why that is. Today we're going to be addressing the question, what does the Bible say on abortion, and what is the Christian response? But this is far more than just the problem of sin of abortion. See, it's important for us that we understand that we're not just addressing sin. We are ministering to people. Abortion has two faces, one of the child and the other, the mother. And to neglect either one is wrong. We will be addressing the two faces of abortion today, and today, graciously, you met one of them. The face I see every single day is a woman who loves her daughters, loves me, loves the Lord, and loves her church family dearly. And so what we do is we create these caricature, caricatures of people. But when I see my wife, I don't see some compassionless, malicious, spiteful, cruel, and heartless individual. The story you heard today from my wife is not the fringe. It's what a lot of women experience and go through. When women get pregnant and they're young, they're not married, they're unemployed, or they have career aspirations, these thoughts run through their mind and they're sold a lie from our culture. This is medicine. That's not a human being. And they're all lies. And so let's address the first face of abortion, the child. We're going to go through some of the objections that are brought forth by the pro-choice movement as we address Scripture as well. But the first thing I want to do is to put a face to this side of abortion. One day, one of our friends who we'd become close to through ministry, she called us up out of nowhere and told us that she was pregnant. She said, I cannot support another child. And in fact, I've seen a lot of growth from her up to this point. She has invested a lot of time in her faith. She's met me in the back of the church and prayed and confessed and addressed sins in her life. She's been, she was active in her constant submission to the Lord. And when she spoke to us, 
she told us that abortion crossed her mind. But the Holy Spirit pressed against that. She still had no idea what she was going to do, but she still called. But what if she didn't? What if Ashley didn't have a church? What if Ashley didn't have a relationship with a family who she could be open with and honest with and tell you, this is what I'm going through? Or even to give us the opportunity to say, we will adopt that baby. And then to be brave enough to continue forward in that. If she didn't have this, I know for a fact my life would be drastically different. I know that I wouldn't have grown as a man. I would not have realized the love of my heavenly father as he has adopted me. My daughter, that little girl you all know and love, that blue-eyed, beautiful miracle, she would have been harvested for her parts and sold to the highest bidder. Abortion has a face. At this time, I'd like for you to turn to Psalm 139 with me. There's two passages of Scripture we're going to be going through today. Psalm 139 is the first. If you want to make note, John 4 is the next. But right now, we're going to go through Psalm 39 and look at a couple verses. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few verses, and we're going to stop, and we're going to address what these verses mean, because this this passage of Scripture gives us an answer to the face that we're addressing now. The Bible talks about the face in the womb. And so as we begin to go through Psalm 139, we're going to begin at verse 13. The psalmist writes, For you formed my innermost parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. You see, the author is describing this intimate process of creation. This word for cover, or this word for creation, or, or that you've wove me together, or you created my innermost beings, rather, this is also used when speaking of the cover, God's covering, almost as to describe his protection. And so this adds an incredible depth to the text as well as we consider that this creation that the psalmist is referring to also speaks of the covering that God gives us. You see, it was once said that the safest place on earth is the mother's womb. And this author knew that the womb not only was the place of creation, but it was also the safety which God had provided to cover the child. Verse 14, I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Awesomely is a word that in some translations it says I am fearfully made. But this is a word that is meant to bring inspired reverence. It's to cause astonishment. It, it provokes in the person, a sense of awe to the creator. And so the psalmist is not having a Kanye West moment here where he's like, boy, I'm awesome. What he's saying is, my creation by the Father, my creation by God, draws about from me a sense of worship and awe of what he has created. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. You see, this verse begins to draw more to the surface. My frame was not hidden from you. There are several uses of this word in Hebrew, and, and, and two of those are to hide or to cut off. And so the author is stating that his form, who he was, was not cut off from the Father at any moment, but that there was a knowledge of him. And this is important because elsewhere in Scripture, we see this being communicated. When God spoke to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, the first part of verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And this no is not simply this, oh yeah, I'm familiar with. This no, which is cited in, in Jeremiah 1, but alluded to in Psalm 139, is a knowing by experience. 
Now, this is going to be kind of difficult for us to wrap our minds around, but we, we need to try. God is omnipresent. He's not bound by our time and space, which means he can fully know who we are, know our quirks, know our failures, know our mistakes, knows us by experience before we were ever born. Another interesting detail in verse 15 is it says skillfully formed. This is a process of mixing colors. So take painting, for example. I still grew up in a generation where you would randomly flip through channels and uh, you'd come across Bob Ross. And if Bob Ross didn't make you feel like a failure, I don't know what did. What he was able to create so effortlessly but the way he did it, by mixing the colors, by creating, you see what he's making, and it does, you try and follow along, but you give up three minutes in, and then you just marvel at his ability. But the mixing of the colors, it's important because if you're going to have shade here, you're going to have a burst of color here. It's so vitally important that the mixing of those colors is perfect. You see, this communicates the remarkable detail of the person and the mixing that takes place to shape who we are in the womb, who we are going to be. It communicates a beautiful image of God's workmanship. Verse 16, Your eyes have seen my formless substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained me, when as, I, um, when as yet there was not one of them. Again, we go back to the omnipresence of God. But then we have this life. The psalmist is speaking of saying, my life is authored, that you know my life. So before we ever take our first breath, he knows us. He knows us personally. He knows our mistakes, our quirks, our flaws, all that stuff. And he knows us by experience. Before we ever take our first breath, before our parents even met, With this in mind, I cannot imagine the heartbreak to know someone, to know someone that this, the, the psalmist is speaking of, that this book that records who I am. I can't imagine the heartbreak of God to know us personally, and yet in that book we have referred 62 million times, killed in the womb. As though God says, my creation, who I knew, who I wanted you to know, gone. The first face of this modern day Holocaust is the child in the womb. And this child is innocent in all of this. Now there is way too much to get into. Um, in fact, I don't think the pulpit's really the place to do it. But we know exactly where babies come from. We know how that happened. There's only one physical act done by a man and a woman that will bring forth life. It's been known from day one. So let's not pretend like we're surprised this happened. Some of the arguments that are thrown out to approve of abortions are threefold. What about rape, incest, and the mother's life? They're bolstered as justification. Now these maybe make up 3% of all abortions. But this 3% is then trying to be leveraged to then justify the other 97%. This is why there is no common ground. There is no middle ground. There is no making peace. And so they will try and take this 3% and justify the other 97, which have nothing to do with rape, incest, or the mother's life. So first, let's address the argument of rape. Certainly, in the time and place that the Bible was written, especially in the Old Testament, human rights were hard to find, especially for women. And yet what we find in Scripture as we find, even though within a patriarchal society, we see restitution for the victim, we see the offender 
having to pay that restitution in various ways from paying for the crime and then paying for the marriage dowry. So what would happen in this time is there would be a man who was interested in a woman and he would want to marry her. Well, if the father either rejected or accepted, he still had to pay a marriage dowry. So if a daughter of a father was assaulted, of course the father would reject that marriage. But that man was still responsible for paying an additional cost to that relationship. So there was, there was that. But you know something? We also come to Deuteronomy 22. And in Deuteronomy 22, we find the death penalty for rape. Can I get an amen on that? We find incredible human rights, not just for all people, but for women in a time where there weren't many rights. No one would ever condone rape, and the Bible doesn't either. But the argument is, do you expect her to raise a child who looks like the person who violated her? And to that I say, no, I don't expect her to raise that child. But I do expect her to carry that child and give that child up for adoption. Now that may seem like an extreme stance, and it may come across that way. We may feel like only the woman is being punished in that regard. But even notice the phrasing of that. We're communicating that the child is a punishment. We're communicating that that child is, is now her burden, her punishment. We're calling that child, that life, a punishment. And so I'll say this outright. Rapists no longer need to draw breath from this world. And it shouldn't be a long, drawn-out process. There shouldn't be an appeal. But I would also say that that child had nothing to do with what happened. That life is not a punishment. Jennifer Christie is a woman who is one of the 32,000 women a year who conceive through rape. But what I found pretty incredible is, of these 32,000, the statistics show that 75% of them choose life. That really blew me away, but I'd still like to see that be 100%. Again, the child had nothing to do with the evil of the man who violated. In fact, you'll come to find that that child will love you and adore you, which is the exact opposite of the offender. And so I'm not going to go into detail of her story. If you'd like, please record her name. Go on YouTube and listen to her testimony. I don't think this is the time or place to go into that detail. But essentially, she was attacked, and in one day, she was about to have tests done, and she was tested to be pregnant. She found out that she was carrying a child. She knew it couldn't be her husband's because he had a vasectomy, and lo and behold, it was, in fact, from the perpetrator. She said, this was the darkest time in my life, but when I saw that little dot on the ultrasound screen, something came alive in me for the first time since the assault. She goes on to describe what she felt. She said, I felt hope, joy, and light. But what blew me away about her interview, when she was speaking about the assault, she said, I fought as hard as I could, and I could not protect myself. There was nothing that I could do, but I could protect that baby, and it is my baby. When she told her husband about the pregnancy at, while she was getting the procedure done, his response was, this is a gift. We love babies. And she agreed wholeheartedly. But see, this is what happens when a child is seen for who he or she truly is. This is what happens when we get outside of ourselves. A baby is not a curse regardless of how that child has entered the world. Yes, the rapist needs to be prosecuted, and in my opinion, they don't need to be living anymore. But that child had nothing to do with that evil. Now, you may not find yourself being able to raise the child being in that situation. That does not make you evil. People handle trauma differently. But adoption is a valuable alternative. You can ask someone you trust if they would adopt the child. That's how we got Evelyn. You can ask a Christian organization to help you find a family. 
But to punish the child for the sins of their father is not justice. Some questioned Jennifer and asked her, where was God? Where was God in all of this? And her response was, my God was all over that situation. She said, I was being dragged away, probably to be killed, and someone intervened. I was left in the snow, which kept my brain from swelling, which is exactly why I'm still here today. And here's the beautiful irony of this situation. You have a woman who is brutally assaulted, left for dead, and to the offspring of this incident, she says, He was my healing. I could not get through the past four years without this child. Now for a moment, can we look at this situation from the perspective of that little boy? His donor, and I refuse to call him a father, that's not a father, his donor was a rapist. But now he has a father, a mother, and siblings who love him. And it's like from this perspective, this family seems to sound exactly like Joseph in Genesis chapter, or chapter 50 where he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Yes, even God can redeem this. Well, what about the case of incest? First, once again, we're dealing with taking the sins of a perpetrator out upon an innocent person. And so allow me to introduce to you Christy Hoffberber. Her story began, or at least she thought it began, when her mother was 16 years old. She didn't really want any more information about her, her family until she hit 30. And about that time, she really believed that there were questions that she needed to be resolved. So she searched for her mother. She said, what I found out was something that I was not really prepared for. Her mother was conceived by the rape of her father. Tragically, her mother conceived six times by her biological father. Christy was the only one to survive. Four of them following were all aborted. It was not until Christy was 13 that her birth mother pressed charges on the man who violated her after 20 years of abuse. And that was when Christy's adopted family saw it in the newspaper and began to see who her mother was. Christy made it absolutely clear that it was because of her faith that she knew that she had to forgive her father, not just because the Bible commands it, but she knew that she would never be free if she didn't. Apart from her incredible story, I was very impressed by her profound statement when she said, when you tell a woman who becomes pregnant by rape or incest that she should end the life of her unborn child, realize you are not protecting the victims, you are protecting the perpetrator. Well, now we come to the most difficult of them all. What if the mother's life is at risk? You see, this one's difficult because it's a call that is made oftentimes in a very vulnerable moment. What about when the, when the mother's life is in danger? And for this, I'd like to share a conversation I had with my wife. This is a conversation every man and woman should have as they're going through pregnancy. And the question I asked was, what should I do if it's between you and the child? Not a fun conversation to have, not a fun situation to put yourself in. But I knew that I had to get the answer because I knew that if faced with that decision, there were going to be a lot of family members who hated me. But I remember asking her, and I remember her looking at me with such conviction, and she said, you saved that baby. I needed to hear it from her. But I knew why. I say it was a conversation, but it wasn't a conversation. It was a, in fact, dialogue. There was no question in her mind what the decision should have been. And I understood. For years she struggled with her past. You see, people don't tell you this. When women get an abortion, the hurdle that is in front of them is helping them to see that there is forgiveness in Christ Jesus. But the mountain that is ahead is them forgiving themselves. The world says, you only care about the baby until it's born. 
Have you heard that? Apart from that being complete bull, my reply is you only care about the mother until she aborts. Because if we're fortunate enough as a church, because this doesn't happen often, the church is left picking up the pieces of their bogus lie. When a child is removed from the mother, she knows someone was taken from her, and she authorized it. I've never met a single woman in all my years of ministry that I had to convince that there was a life that was taken that day. Not once. And I firmly believe any mother would lay down their life for their child, whether it's out there or in the delivery room. But the problem is, women have been lied to since 1973. Women believe the lie that of Planned Parenthood and pro-choice affiliates. And I can only describe this lie as from being from the pits of hell itself. Now understand, I would have hated to have made that call. 2020 was a rough year for everyone. But I'll be honest with you, from February to May when Evelyn was born, that period of time during quarantine was the best time of our marriage. Don't go outside. Perfect. I'm a homebody. What did we do? We went down into the basement almost every night. We played ping pong. We watched one of the few shows we liked together, River Monsters. And we hung out every night. We spent so much time together. It was wonderful. Well, I would have hated making that call. I would have hated having to say goodbye to my best friend. But she told me to save that baby. And I knew it. And I knew that's what needed to be done. But praise God, I didn't have to make that call. Now I get to have my two girls and my best friend all together. But her conviction shares even in the very words of Jesus where he said, No one has taken up my life from me, but I lay it down. Thank God he spoke of that, of our salvation. A Bible-believing Christian has no grounds to be anything other than pro-life. We recognize that the Bible teaches that we are Genesis 127, that we are image bearers of God, that we were created in his image, male and female. We understand that the scientific facts and biology are on our side, that upon conception, we see a unique human being being formed in the womb. Most women don't even find out they're pregnant until at least five weeks later. And by this time, which is the embryonic period, the baby's major system structures develop. Blood cells, kidney cells, nerve cells, their brain, spinal cord, their heart begins to develop. If left to run its course, pregnancy always brings about a human being. Now, I know that sounds stupid. Of course. But the reason why this is so important for us to understand is that if pregnancy left to its own processes never brought about anything other than a human being. Which means there is no reason why we should call what is in, who is in the womb anything other than a human being. No one ever had a dog. Every single time it is a little boy or a little girl. And to call that child anything other than a human being is a lie. But here's what we do. Here's what society has done. If we rename it, if we call it something else, we can justify this. That's not a human being, that's an embryo. That's not a human being, that's a clump of cells. Let's rename it so that it's not so bad. The Bible is very clear in Deuteronomy 5.17. Now understand, I'm speaking to the skeptic or stiff-necked. I'm not speaking to mothers. I'm not speaking to anyone who has had or struggled with their decision of an abortion. I'm speaking to the stiff-necked at this point. Deuteronomy 5.17 says, You shall not commit murder. Abortion is murder. Exodus 20.13, You shall not murder. Now the hard-headed might say, Well, it's not murder. Okay. Uh, Leviticus 24.17, the first part says... Now if you, now if someone takes any human life, well, what's the punishment? God says you are to be put to death. And so please understand, I'm speaking to the skeptic. 
There's no denying apart from rejecting science and biology to identify who is growing in the womb, but as anything other than a human being. Now, as Christians, we know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We know we respond to sin, but we have to understand that if we respond to sin with sin, it will not bring resolution, it will not bring healing, or remove what has happened. God can and will work in the midst of suffering, but when we try and take it into our own hands, we create more. We suffer more. We make a cut, a laceration. We cause more harm to ourselves. The first face of abortion is innocent. Maybe you've made a mistake. You've had a one-night stand. Maybe some immature coward abandoned you. Maybe you're unable to provide for the child. Maybe you're a victim of a horrible act. The first face of abortion had nothing to do with that. Whether it was a poor decision on your part or an evil one by someone else, the child in no way is responsible for it. But let's talk about the second face of the mother. If you could, please turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Now, I bring this up because we can get caught up in addressing the sin of abortion and focus on the sin, but we forget about the other person. I've never spoken to a woman who's had an abortion that did not regret it dearly. So when we speak against the sin, oftentimes we forget that there are very real people involved. And so in John chapter 4, we're going to be going through verses 3 through 26. However, I'm going to be summarizing most of it. So I want to encourage you, go back and read this on your own and follow the story as well. And so summarizing, Jesus is leaving Judea and he's heading towards Galilee. To get to Galilee, there's one of two ways you can go. You can go straight through Samaria or you can go around. Now, why would somebody go around and add a couple more days to their journey? Well, it's because Samaria was considered so sinful that Jewish or real religious people would go around Samaria and not even pass through it. But what I find very interesting with this topic at hand is verse 4. It says, he had to pass through Samaria. But it's better translated, he needed to pass through Samaria. John MacArthur clears this up. He says, The Apostle John often used this word when speaking of Jesus as it pertained to his mission given to him by the Father. As Jesus is traveling through, he comes to Jacob's well, and there's a woman sitting there getting water. Verses 6 through the first part of verse 7 says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired. And as tired from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now these two verses hide so much depth, but we're going to see that depth by finishing out the story and then circling back. And so, Jesus, having a conversation with this woman, he's slowly revealing to her that he is the Messiah. He asked for a drink. She's blown away because she knows that he's a Jew, and she's blown away that this Jewish man would ever engage her, a Samaritan woman, and ask anything from her, no less, for sustenance. Jesus tells her that he is the living water. Well, she takes this literally, and Jesus continues to speak to her of salvation through this living water. She wants this water. Though she's still taking this literally, Jesus says to her, beginning in verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. Verse 25, 
the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. In verse 26, if anyone had any question, has Jesus ever declared to be the Messiah or, become, or be God? Jesus declares it right here, verse 26. I am the one speaking to you. I am he. Now we go back to verse 6 and 7. Jesus reveals to her that he's the Messiah. And so he's offering her salvation. And that salvation is in light of knowing everything she's done. He's speaking to her, having known already everything she's done. He's engaging. He's asking for water. He's telling her about the Messiah. He's telling her about himself, knowing everything about her. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was far from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now this woman, as a result of her past, which Jesus discloses, this past made her an outcast. So where she lived, she could have gone to closer freshwater sources, but she avoided them. But not only that, she all, it also says that it was about noontime. So she's walking farther at the hottest time of the day. Why? To avoid people. When they gathered water, they would do it in the mornings and in the evenings, and yet this woman has chosen when it is the hottest to, to walk the farthest just so she can get away from the ridicule, the scoffs, the mocking. She walks while it's hotter and she walks farther to avoid people. But remember what the text said. She, that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. She's why. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, church. Regardless of the situation, when a woman is pregnant and afraid, she needs to see what we find here as Jesus goes to her. When all the religious folks are saying, no, just go around. Avoid her altogether. Don't waste your time. She's a lost cause. What she's done is too much. The religious have plenty to say about that. Instead, we see Jesus needed to go to Samaria. And I think of my wife in a time like this. When a young girl is facing an incredible responsibility, still being a child herself, now being pushed into adulthood, overwhelmed by what lies ahead. What will people think of me? What will my family say? What will I do? How can I support this child? And that's where the church needs to meet her we need to meet her at that well with Jesus. We, when this young girl or woman is terrified by the questions that are weighing her down, the church is the place she should be able to come to. But instead, they would rather walk where it is hotter and walk even farther just to avoid these doors and confess what has happened. And that's our fault. We failed. Now, I understand the vast majority of pregnancies are brought about by a mistake. Poor decisions, one night stand, dating the wrong guy, the list goes on. But I also understand that there needs to be some semblance of repentance on her part. But when the church communicates to a woman that she messed up royally, we are communicating to her that who grows in her womb is a mistake. How many women would have avoided the murder of their child had a church come along and said, you're going to be okay. And you're going to be okay because we are going to help you. How many girls would have carried their child to term if when we saw their belly growing, we did not treat her as though her sin were growing? Instead, we're faced with what the world says. The world says, come to us. Come to this oxymoronic place we call planned parenthood. Where the majority of our services is to destroy parenthood. They say, come to us. We will take your burdens. 
will take your burdens from you. But that we all know that that's a lie as Christians. Why? Jesus addresses this in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is comfortable, and my burden is light. The burden is the sin, not the gift. The burden is the sin, not the child. And yet we communicate to these women, you need to move away and find a new location, find another place, relocate. It's no secret what has taken place. God knows what's happened. So you got drunk and made a mistake. You let your emotions of a long-term relationship blind you from reality. I get it. I've been there. You don't hide from it. Call it what it is. Repent because he is faithful and just to forgive. That child is a gift no matter how that child has come into being. And so if you're facing this and you don't know what to do, you find yourself not being able to support a child, you find yourself overwhelmed by what's facing you, the truth of the matter is, We will adopt your child. And so let's let's establish this right now. If 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 a young lady were to come here and say, I'm about to have a child and I can't support it, or I I or even just go so far, I don't want this child, but I don't want to abort it. Who right now would volunteer and begin the process of adoption to get take that child? The church needs to be the place where people can come, where people can say, this is what I'm going through. This is what I've, this is what I've done. I need someone to take care of me. I need someone to care for what I've done. I need someone to take care of this child. Abortion is not just the time in which a child is taken away. For a woman, they take a piece of your heart that day. I've seen too many women haunted by this mistake, and God bless her, you met one of them today. Church, we need to go through Samaria. If people cannot be open about their past, cannot communicate their fears, talk about their mistakes, cannot confide in the doubts that they have, if they can't do that here, then where on earth can they? If they can't come here and be honest with us about what's going on in their life, even if they have evidence of their sin. See, what separates me from someone who has gone through this, one, I'm a guy. You don't know. The difference between my sin is there and theirs is you see some sort of semblance of, of that gift growing inside of them. But men, we're, we're not exempt from this. Why, why, why do women feel as though this is the only option? Because too many boys in grown-up clothes Abandon the moment responsibility rears its ugly head. We're not exempt. There's repentance that many men need to have because we're just as responsible. But the truth of the matter is that the cross was big enough for all of our sins. There's not a single sin that you could fathom that did not make it up on that cross. Every single sin you've ever committed, every single sin you're going to commit is on that cross. So if for a single moment you think that it's too much, I remember a pastor told me this once, JR, your sins didn't break that cross. And because it didn't break, you know, every one of them were brought to an account. And maybe that's something you need to hear today. You think your sins are too big for that cross. Well, guess what? It didn't break. And the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive. Why? Because those sins have already been brought to an account. So maybe you're here and maybe this is something that hits home. Maybe it's something that you've never really addressed. It's something you've never talked about with anyone. Allow us to help you through that recovery. Allow us to help you through that healing. But maybe you're sitting here today and it has nothing to do. Maybe you're just up here like me and you're just thinking about how much you love your kids and how you're falling short. Maybe there's something like that you need to talk about. Hey, I need, I need to love my kids better. 
I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. Whatever it may be, meet me in the back. We'd love to be able to minister to you, encourage you, and equip you to take those steps in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the clarity that we have We thank you, Lord, for the depth in which your writers have communicated to us. I know this subject matter is a very sensitive one. I know it's one that everyone is very passionate about. But I do pray, Father, that if we find ourselves trying to straddle the fence, if we find ourselves trying to compromise, to find middle ground, that we understand that this world is not looking for middle ground. And neither should we. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who's going through this, if there's anyone who's listening online, that they would reach out to us and allow us to come alongside them and either help them through this pregnancy or, if need be, to adopt their child upon the birth. Lord, we thank you for life. We thank you for the life that you have blessed us with. Regardless of the suffering and hardships many of us have gone through, we are so thankful, Lord, for the life that you have blessed us with. We ask you, Lord, that you continue to work in our lives. Sanctify us. Make us more like your son, that we can better love those around us and love those who need a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.